In this episode, we'll discuss having personal integrity and how it makes for the softest pillow. We'll discuss things like compassion-driven kindness, the five foundational principles to peace and joy, learning how to think instead of what to think, and how to live a life of clarity, non-fragmented reality. Be brutally honest with yourself. How kind are you towards yourself? Where do you judge yourself for the craving to be gracious with yourself? And how do you honestly view compassion? Does it carry a weak undertow that has you dismiss the strength that it actually has? Welcome to Weekly Wins and Losses. My name is James Hepner, former real estate entrepreneur turned self-development hacker, coach, and fulfillment strategist. Each week, we bring you a thought to wrestle with that will help you live fully alive and gain more life. Real life is made up of both wins and losses. Both were designed for your good. That's basic reality. Without facing and learning how to embrace your losses for greater gain, you miss out. You leave 50% of your life experience on the table. So with that, let's begin the show. With inflation rates rising, interest rates shooting up, gas prices skyrocketing, and the continued global unrest, it's easy to find what's wrong in the world. Tony Robbins says, what's wrong in the world is always available, but so is what's right. Instead of trying to hope and wish the world into a better place, it's time to make the most important decision any of us can ever make, and that is to invest in yourself. Now, You know I've always stood with you as you've navigated the uncertainties of life's reality. However, it's now time that I step up and take decisive action to walk alongside your current life journey in a new way. And that is by making myself available to you in a radical new way during these challenging times. So for a limited time, I'm inviting you to a 45-minute strategic business life consultation. No charge and no strings attached. This consultation is where you'll regain the reins of your life. It's where you'll gain clarity on exactly why you're stuck, moving you directly towards your optimal outcomes. And I'll be honest, and I'm humbled to say, however, my client's generous reflection of their time spent with me reveals the truth. The skills they've been able to master in such a short period of time by engaging in our one-on-one strategic sessions have changed their lives in so many ways. This is the only invitation that I can fathom that will put my skin in the game of your life in such a way that will allow us, you and I, to address your specific needs with precision and excellence. 45 minutes, just you and I, together on one call to get you headed in the direction you crave most. Here's what my clients report after one-on-one sessions with me. A decrease in indecision. A increase in clarity, confidence, and courage. An increase to fully capitalize on what's directly before them. An increase in the impact that they crave to have at work, on their families, and inside their communities. A decrease in pain and suffering. A decrease in anxiety. So, if you want to move beyond old stories, get clear in where you're headed so that you can shake your world, then here's a rich opportunity for you today. One-on-one strategic business life consultation with me. One-on-one, 45 minutes. So, if you want to maximize this opportunity, if you want to reclaim and regain your inner power, then you're going to want to slow things down during these challenging times. And how? Well, engaging and getting right with your life, making a life plan. I should let you know that this offer will fill up and expire. Click in the show notes to get your 45-minute strategic business life consultation. No charge, no strings attached. May this episode change your everyday life. Well, welcome, friends. This week, we have on our show Joshua Kramer. Joshua is an interesting cat. I'll tell you something. When (laughs) I first met this guy, I'm like, there's something about him. I'm like, what is this guy? And then all of a sudden I realized, oh, okay. He's an unself-help person. (laughs) I'm like, oh, this is partly why. So Joshua, of course, he's a creator of the Unicorn and You. 
and that unself help approach um, and a personal growth and development perspective that emphasize. So the unicorn in you, it emphasizes the five key principles as the foundation for peace and joy. Uh, he's involved in real estate. Uh, he's an executive there. And he's also a managing partner of Kramer Chandler, a founding partner of Real Connex and an active member of YPO. Joshua, welcome to the show. Thank you, my friend. Great to be here. Been looking forward to this one. Oh, and you probably say, it's funny, I was on a talk a little while ago and the person says, you probably say it to everyone. I'm like, no, actually I don't. <laughs> Correct. <laughs> so, 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 so you and I are similar. I mean, you know, I like to think we're all like this, but I think you and I are similar in the sense we say what we mean and that's how we live, right? So That's right. So when you say looking forward to, you know, to the show, it, uh, yeah, no, likewise, I, I was glad that we get you in as quick as we could. So it's fun. Awesome. Awesome. This is great. So happy to be here with you. Beautiful awesome. spring day, and uh, we're going to have a great conversation. Mm -hmm. Well, speaking of beautiful, you have beautiful sunshine there, so perhaps you have it a little nicer. We have it here in Vancouver, but I'm. it was raining today, but hey, I was raised on the farm in Manitoba. It's in southern, uh, or it's in uh, central Canada, and there it's really cold for most of the winter, and here it rains. So I moved to Vancouver. It's western Canada, and so now when it rains, I'm just so thankful because it seems like spring all on the farm when it rained, it was spring. So <laughs> there you go go so That's you're living great. spring sun i'm living spring rain there you go yeah and and we have the emergence of spring i'm just outside of new york city new jersey and for mm. me it's a little bittersweet because mm. as a kid i always suffered from seasonal allergies mm. and this is my two-week period where they're really bad all the pollen and oh, everything sorry. is kind of in bloom so mm -hmm. but this is a nice reprieve to be indoors and chat with you that's wonderful that's just awesome all right, Joshua, tell us, where would you like to begin now? And I just throw that out over like super, super loose. But why don't I just begin by preferencing for people here, like something that you and I uh, realized quite quickly that we had in common. We were talking about how about we just start with heartfelt instead of all the surface play. Right? Right. So you and I, we just went straight in. Tell me, what is it about you? Like, I know what it is for me, why I like to go deep real quick, not, not to skip any of the fun nuance of playing around on the surface, but surfacey, what we're talking about is, you know, stuff that really is misused. It's, it's really, it creates distraction, brings traction right. away from the traction that we create. Why and where did this all begin for you? This heartfelt, let's go there instantly. You know, what is it? You know, I think back a lot mm. to when I was growing up and I remember very clearly being a very shy kid. And by extension, mm. I was an observer mm. and I could have extroverted tendencies. I enjoy being social and playing. I like sports. I had friends, but I think by nature, I was more comfortable in the background observing. Mm. And in many ways, it kind of puts you in touch, even though you didn't know it at the time with your feelings. You could identify them easier in others because you are now observing rather than having to always be talking. I'm a believer that I learn more from listening to others than I do from hearing from myself. But I think at an early age, I identified with being in the background and watching. I enjoyed observing. I enjoyed probably watching human behavior. And from that, I think that I was able to be more comfortable with myself. Mm -hmm. I think that I probably, as a, as a shy kid, um, you had to navigate those feelings that were difficult even at times mm -hmm. because you knew that, okay, maybe I wasn't comfortable, you know, being more out, outgoing and being more outward. So I think for me, it started at an early age and probably only now as an adult have emerged and sort of benefiting me in terms of that vulnerability, not being for its own sake. They're having mm -hmm. some real purpose and use for it. Isn't it interesting when you say outgoing outward, yeah. it's like, Oh, perhaps we're outgoing inward. <laughs> right. <laughs> right. Cause I know, well, you know, when you say shy, like I can relate with you because most of my childhood, I was pretty shy too. And uh, they often say shy, by the way, is just uh, focusing on, on your significance, you know, or vo overt focus there. And I think, well, I don't, I'm not sure, but well, as a child, perhaps I'm, I don't know how this all goes, but um, I can relate with you. So um, the inside world of you, you and I have chatted, uh, I think last time we were on the phone for near an hour, we were doing a little Zoom together, mm -hmm. and uh, I find your inner space just fascinating. Like, there you are living in Jersey, and you got such a big heart. And I think if I'm not mistaken, you own part of the company, like your real estate firm, correct? Right. Yeah, it's a it's a it's a family business that I kind of created my own business within. So I'm fortunate to have that 
certainly that foundation, which that word will become important as we talk later on, but I've had that foundation and that, that good fortune and privilege, but wanted to carve out my own niche. So I do have mm-hmm. that, um, you know, owner's mentality. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. So us on the West coast, we're kind of chill. And sometimes they say the East coast is kind of like, let's get the deal done. Right. right. And so some of us have experience with, it used to be the person that said you're fired. And then it, that person became the president. And so sometimes we associate East coast real estate to being like, you're fired and let's get it done and screw you. But when I met you, I'm like, dude, this brother, he is, he is, he is something unique. This, this guy's got heart. He's got feels. And I like him. If I was looking for real estate, I'm a real estate investor, but currently I'm not investing in, you know, Eastern Canada or United States. But uh, if I was looking for real estate down your way, my friend, I'd be looking you up. But anyway, um, I think that's why I probably was not a successful commercial broker because I was always the soft sell and I couldn't get behind pushing. In fact, my first job interview, someone said to me, look, you're too nice. This is not for you. Don't do it. And I ended up touching different parts of the business, but I always wanted to stay true to who I was. Mm. And I felt like the almost uh, the results would take care of themselves. Mm. Mm. And the way I did things was more important than kind of those results. Mm. The way you did things. Well, seems like, and there's many ways of doing life, but it seems like some people focus on what to do and other people focus on how to do it. Mm-hmm. Talk to me a bit about the how, because I'll be honest, you and I, though similar, we're different. And that, the good news is we can be different and we can learn from other people on how they do life. Yeah. And, and, you know, it's interesting, you and I, we just had, and it's so weird, like, mm-hmm. you know, when you meet people that are so like, you and I are similar that way, we focus on the how, the what, like I was, when I was a child, I was basically told what I should be thinking all the time. And of course I get so satiated with that crap. <laughs> so, so here I am. But anyway, so, so the how. Talk to me about how. Yeah, the how comes from, I think, probably my upbringing that I then turned to to something that was more meaningful to me. Going back to the real estate piece of it, because that's sort of interesting. I remember my grandfather, who was very important to me. He was the second generation in our family business. I'm the fourth. But if there was one thing I took away from my relationship with him, he passed away when I was 24. He used to say that your word is your bond. And I think that informs so much of how I conducted myself in business. I'd rather, you know, come out on the other end or on the short end for myself, so long as I knew that I was doing the right thing. And that in many ways, this was the start of the how, how I did something mattered so much more than that result or the what. Mm -hmm. And even now I find that I think that I'm trying to find that, that how I think the how in many ways tells us all who we are. And mm. how we're able to be whole, you know, identify in many ways that essence that makes us special. And for me, you know, business, uh, I never really identified myself as a, as a real estate executive. It was something that I did. It wasn't driven by passion per se. Mm. You know, this type of conversation, I think, w- w- connected so much more deeply with who I was deep down in, the, in, in what I wanted to spend my time doing, having really meaningful discussions and conversations about how we can all be better. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. I love it when you said your words or your word is your bond. Perhaps, and sometimes we don't know why we click so much with an individual. But a little story. So my dad, again, was a farmer in in central Canada. And um, he's also a pastor and he had a few different roles. And one of the things that I became very aware of in his life, uh, he took very seriously that if he shook hands with someone, he didn't need to go to a lawyer to buy a piece of you know, machinery or if he borrowed out a, a special piece or whatever, my word is my bond. And one of the things that he decided was that, and to your point on how to be whole, for him, his version of whole is if you borrow something, you bring it back to the neighbor in as good, if not cleaner condition. That was his worldview, right? And so he was like, my word is my bond. And he lives on those principles. I don't think he, I don't think he had a lawyer. He has a will likely, but I don't think he had a lawyer for any kind of dispute or it's, this stuff just didn't happen, you know? And, uh, and so, so I think that, so yeah, within that uh, we can see uh, perhaps why you and I have this connection, right? So it's I like was going to say, mm-hmm. oh, I love that. And you know what? It's that's a man of integrity, obviously. I mean, mm-hmm. that's that's the definition. And it's funny. Similarly, our kinship mm-hmm. continues because my father, who is now effectively retired, but he mm-hmm. 
he always would tell the same story and he would say it in a way that now I understand why it, it meant so much. And he would basically mm -hmm. say, we have contracts with our partners, but our real contract is a handshake. I mean, I've heard uh, him say it a hundred times wow. and he's right. Wow. And because mm -hmm. that has to mean something when you shake someone's hand. Mm -hmm. And I have a, a partner up in New England area that gave me a great line. This was mm -hmm. about 10 years ago. We got involved in hospitality project. And he said to me, you know, within our, our walls, we used to say that once you have to say, well, what does the contract say? You're done. It's over. That's right. That means, that means we're not having a conversation anymore. Yeah. And we have to yeah. look specifically at what it is yeah. to the letter. Beautiful. And, and I, I always think about that now, whenever I do anything and whenever the first person almost says, whoever says, what does the contract say first? They lose mm -hmm. um, because now they're not being true. And they're not saying, I still want to do the right thing. Mm-hmm. And now the heart is unengaged. We're not connected because the what's focusing. And again, what does a contract, what does a letter say? What does a letter of the law say? And dude, we're just trying to, we're looking to see if we can correct your error or find you in error. But for us to connect, oh, that's way too much work, apparently. <laughs> when yet yeah, right. you and I, we can't help but just be like, the only work we want to be about is to connect. Because as soon as we're focused on correction, my friend, then it's just all litigation, lawyers, and honestly, a document, a piece of paper, that you can poke holes in it all day long. And to the degree that you have the funding, uh, you can play that game forever, right? Talk to us a little bit, uh, Joshua, about, you know, in relation, you were saying you referenced about being whole. And I'm fascinated there. And one of the things that I'm connecting with um, and just wanting us to reconcile, how do, you, um, how do you play with the concept of whole through the lens of integrity? So you brought into integrity. So what does that mean? And in, in, in how would you define whole and integrity and how those two play yeah. together. Mm -hmm. I, th I think I, I consider whole in that word so important because for so long, I felt the opposite of it, almost disjointed and fragmented and not able to get a real clear sense of who I was and mm -hmm. what I stood for. And, you know, I was at a conference probably oh, back in November of uh, 21, and it was a prominent author mm -hmm. and speaker, and he had a whole you know, idea on values and principles, which is dear to me because of my book and what my perspective is. And he got to integrity and he mm -hmm. basically said, what is integrity anyway? You know, let's break it down. No one really knows what it means. Mm -hmm. And he mm -hmm. basically shredded this idea that to me is so simple. You either have it or you don't period. End of story. Wow. It's a choice. And that's a choice. And so don't complicate it. That's right. And to me, that idea of being whole uh -huh. starts with integrity because uh -huh. here it removes all the rationalization and justification that we can come up with. Mm -hmm. In fact, in many ways, I have a great quote in, in, in the unicorn in you, where it's this idea that having integrity makes for the softest pillow, right? Mm -hmm. We have a clear conscience. And I think that that, you know, removing the gray area from our decision-making, especially when, you know, my thesis is we're aiming for a path to peace and joy, not the path. There are many, this is a journey, but having a path to peace and joy means that I'm going to take away that rationalization that we all use sometimes mm -hmm. to justify a decision, but rather one of integrity, not in a self-righteous way, but in a way that says, this is what I stand for. These are principles and they mean something. Mm -hmm. And to stay true to those, I think is what almost takes the weight and burden off of our shoulders. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. How do you, I'm curious, your teams, how do you execute uh, leadership that you feel really good about? And of course, leadership often, um, if we're not careful, can, can stretch into controlling people to the finish line. I don't sense you as being that kind of human. How do you, your definition of integrity, how do you make rumor? What do you, uh, and still, and make, yeah, I guess make room for other people in how they define integrity, or do you have a specific training that you draw them into that aspect and that, that, that core central? Yeah. No? It's interesting. I probably should, you know, dig in deeper with the, the, the folks that I work with in the team, but I almost hearken back to you either uh, have it or you don't. <laughs> yeah. It's interesting. Uh, uh, I one time heard Blake Nordstrom speak. He's the fourth generation in the Nordstrom uh, department store. Mm -hmm. And he talked about how mm -hmm. he gives every new employee, our employee handbook. He says, our handbook has one page. It says, do the right thing. Mm -hmm. That's it. That's the, in, in the message was not lost on me. And if anyone knows that when they go to Nordstrom, they're just trained in a certain way where it's, and, you know, uh, 
I'm going to give the customer or the shopper the benefit of the doubt. I'm just going to do the right thing because in the end, that's going to serve us better. Mm -hmm. And I think as I apply to what I do for a living in my business, I have a, a management business for apartments, for folks that really work hard to pay rent that is probably right in the middle of our market. So mm -hmm. these are working class. Um, we would call it workforce housing in Northern New Jersey. Mm -hmm. And at the onset of COVID, when we didn't know what to do, I said, one thing we are going to do is that we're going to work with people. We're going to have a conversation with them. And we almost encourage people, have a dialogue with us. Let us know where you're at. And we're going to, we're going to work together because we're all in it together and not in a way that's just kind of, you know, uh, from business side, I really believe that, especially at that time when it was going to be confusing and scary and producing a lot of anxiety for people. And to me, it was... That in and itself removed a lot of the gray area. Mm -hmm. We're just going to do the right thing. It's interesting. Initiating versus waiting and hoping it doesn't happen. How much angst yeah. and fear, uh, you know, <laughs> we actually instill in our world and bring to the, to our very center of our lives. If Because we know ultimately if we feel something, maybe then that's for us to deal with. Maybe that's for us to reconcile, right? And to your point on you either have it or you don't. I don't know about you, but... Um, some of the businesses that I've owned or people that I've worked with, it's a little like, you know what, it's really hard to train someone to want to be hungry naturally. And there are lines of conundrum naturally and training. They have, they either have a desire and a want for it, or they have a want for something different. And don't get me wrong. I think we're all created great people. Some people just make decisions on, I don't want that right now. Fair enough. And, and perhaps in that season of life, they're not hungry for mm -hmm. wanting to grasp integrity. Perhaps it's too much fun playing over there. We're like, fair enough. You go and do your thing. I'll That's do right. my thing. <laughs> right. And so, it's so you either true. have it or not. You don't really, right? So you hire right. You don't, you don't necessarily train this yeah. piece. You hire right. That's the, that's the essence. And I feel like we had to make some changes initially when I took over this business and the shift was really marked by a desire to, we're going to do things differently. We're going to treat people a little differently. We're going to do it respectfully and understanding this is a business, but at the same time, you know, folks that I work with, they tell me that for people who've been there a long time, they're just a lot happier because they didn't have mm -hmm. to play games with people and also um, compromise their own principles. Mm -hmm. Well, and I think in essence, tell me what you think. I'm willing to be wrong anywhere, but I think what you're in essence doing is you're back to initiation. You are initiating a very raw and helpful stance. And I think humanity is a bit like, hey, listen, when are you going to show me who you really are? When are you going to show me who you really are? Yeah, right? Like, you know, and so when, when you consider uh, the decision you made, reflect back and I'm sure there's growing pains uh, you know you had to let some people go perhaps and we had a shift in perception um, but your best of clients today like what do they say about you I'm hopeful that they say that I uh, mm -hmm. do what I say I'm going to do and mm -hmm. I say what I mean and that my word mm -hmm. means something and that when I wow. shake their hand um, because I've had you know no one bats a thousand, of course, and I've had deals that haven't worked out. And I'd rather make someone feel like they did not get the short end um, versus me, you know, get even a, a fee that I'm legally mm -hmm. owed. Um, mm -hmm. But maybe, you know what, things didn't work out great. So let me let me do the right thing. And that's what the right thing is often. You know, it's not this black and white thing. Someone can listen to our conversation and poke holes. Well, sometimes mm -hmm. there's gray and so forth, mm -hmm. you know. You you know the right thing in many ways. I like to a phrase I've been thinking a lot lately is almost the path reveals itself. Mm. In many ways, sometimes the decision reveals itself very clearly as well. Very nice, very nice, very nice. So for you, it's just time. You just went through. You made a decision. You couldn't be any different. This is how you. This is how you rolled, and you went with it. Um, yeah. How how many years would you say? And I, and of course, I, I don't want to um, put into this this container that your father ran the business in an untoward way. So please don't hear me say this, right? But right. how long would you say it took for you to shift the company and the ethos and the culture towards and the client and who you drew? How long did it take? I think it took a while because I didn't know exactly that that was so important to me. And what I mean by that is this is my second go around in my family business. Mm -hmm. But for the last 15 years, I've kind of created my own um, vehicle within it. 
And it's something that I think because it was in many ways new, I had to define the characteristics that were going to be important. Mm. I knew that we weren't going to be successful all the time, but I knew that we could do our best in, in doing the right thing all the time. Mm. And I think that it, so it took me a little while mm. to get to that point. And this second time around, I knew that something had to be uh, almost done on my terms. You know, because I could live with the results mm. if I know that I'm, you know, mm -hmm. living true to me. That's mm. really what it's about. And I think maybe that's the essence of integrity. You can mm. accept, accept what happens, mm. provided that you're doing it, you know, in the way that is in line mm. and almost that sense of alignment with what's inside mm. of us. What, was there a specific time, and you say you referenced the second go around in your family business, <laughs> You got yeah. gracious, you got gracious family. <laughs> but if you look yeah. at that smile, why not be gracious with a smile like this? You got these pearly whites and it's <laughs> awesome, right? But if you think about um, that, that aspect, was there a specific, a notable, distinct experience you had that you realized this is who I am. And unless I operate like this, I just, it's, it's not worth my time. I'm wasting my time. Um, I got to be about something different. Was there something that made it all just crumble? And then that crumbling perhaps built this infrastructure at the same time. You're like, ah, oh, this is who I am. And you referenced going to events and I hear this, but go ahead. Yeah, no, probably I would say uh, when I came back uh, and I lived in South Florida for time, I came back uh, a second time as well. I've had two stints in Florida, two stints from the family oh, nice. business here in New Jersey. Yeah. And I took over this business and I sensed, I basically wanted to do an evaluation around it. I wanted to give people the benefit of the doubt. Mm -hmm. And I had some longstanding employees there and I was just learning and they were certainly trying to, uh, you know, impress me and get what, get, get on whatever good side needed to be. But I'm just an open book and I believe everyone is a clean slate. And it became very clear that something wasn't right. And I think those that saw this for so long, didn't want to speak up, didn't want to be seen as those who were saying, you know, the, these folks aren't, um, aren't the kind that really represents the best of us. And I think that probably for about a month, I knew that I had to make a change. And for mm -hmm. about a month, I didn't sleep. We were wow. talking about a sleep earlier. Yeah. And because I didn't take it lightly, I knew that this was a change that was necessary, but I also knew that the change was going to affect people who maybe they weren't doing things the way I wanted mm -hmm. um, and weren't necessarily in alignment with my values, but they were still going to be let go mm -hmm. and change was going to have to be made. And I really wrestled with that. I think about it a lot, uh, even today, because mm. I just, I like to, in many ways, use compassion-driven kindness to develop a sense of imagination and letting go of judgments. Mm. And so I tried to maybe put myself in their position and, again, give benefit of the doubt. And it's why I start with kindness in my book, because I feel like that becomes this foundational principle of the foundation. We start with kindness. In fact, I write after the introduction, you know, here are these five principles. It all begins with kindness because in many ways that sets us on the path towards peace and joy. It's so self-serving to us. We get pleasure from it, right? It gives us helpers high. It releases dopamine, all these great things, but it's not for its own sake. It has great, great fundamental value to us. And I think in many ways, it allows us to get in touch with our own emotional vulnerabilities. Mm -hmm. Let's let us let go of ego. Mm -hmm. And in many ways, it gets us out of our own head too. How does compassion and kindness, how are those two things? And I can tell you, you said compassion driven kindness. So those are actually two unique things. I love that. If you don't mind, help us understand. Um, and perhaps uh, I'll just say it like this. One of the things that I detected about you real quick is that you are both firm and soft at the exact same time. So you can let people go, but you do it with this gracious, loving presence. I, think I don't know if you're sniffling compliment. now because you're crying. No, I'm just kidding. You got a stuffy nose. Both allergies <laughs> and you're making me emotional. But that was from our first call. We both got emotional. Our first yeah. call, it's sort of finding, uh, you know, one another to develop this, this strong bond with. And you, you said that to me when we first met as well. Mm -hmm. And I appreciate that because my family would probably say, oh, no, he's firm. And, you know, those on the outside would say he's a softy. And you're right. We're all kind of, you know, yeah. a, a mix of everything. Yeah. And, com and compassion driven kindness. You know, I say that hmm. as kind of this form of when I distill these principles that I felt were so important to me for peace and joy. 
in that unself help way. Mm-hmm. It was kindness by compassion. And then I found what's the other principles and what are the ingredients in those? And that's how I came up with this, this, this sort of perspective. And so very quickly, mm-hmm. it was gratitude driven by awareness. Very intuitively, we know we need awareness to be more mm-hmm. grateful. Integrity, I actually think has to do with decency. And that's my key ingredient there. Mm-hmm. Humility is all about perspective, our sense of our significance or insignificance in the world. And acceptance had to do with flexibility, that mm-hmm. idea that we can hold conflicting views in our head, mm-hmm. still be okay, oh. but that we have this stretch and bend and just flex stop in our it. minds. There you go. That's <laughs> it right there. I mean, you just laid it down. This flexibility. It's like, how can we make room for difference and not feel strained that we should adopt any one of them? It's just onboarding and let it serve, right? Let That's it right. just flow. Let it flow. Spot on. Yeah. What is, what is the unicorn? all about so define mm-hmm. what is that actually because i have this in my mind unicorn this horse and you know this, <laughs> this horn oh you know what is that all about if you don't mind defining that yeah the unicorn i'll i'll give a very very quick story the short version and then i'll tell you what it means to me mm-hmm. had a four-year-old niece playing in the grass in her little unicorn sneakers i complimented them as rainbows she sternly corrected me and said they're unicorns and i looked at them and i looked at her and i said i wish i could feel the way she appeared It was light and joyful as only a child could. Yeah. And in many ways I said, this is aspirational. Mm -hmm. And to me, the, the unicorn is, is virtuous in deed and in heart. Mm -hmm. And I don't say that in a, in a, it's kind of a, you know, a, a corny sort of way, but I really do believe that to me, the unicorn is, you know, colorful and vibrant and represents in many ways our potential. It's playful, it's light, it's peaceful, it's joyful, but it's virtuous in heart and deed. And I think that's really what the unicorn is. In many ways, it's it's that part of all of us. You know, I call the book, The Unicorn in You. It's about, this is my, this is my, you know, uh, foundation of principles, but maybe it prompts someone to say, what's my foundation? And maybe it allows them to take inventory based on my principles, but add to theirs as well. Mm -hmm. And so that's what the unicorn represents to me, finding their own specialness, their own special you and their own potential. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. That month you spent kind of laboring and not sleeping, (laughs) you know, you, you kind of wonder, right? Like, what was that all about? And I can't help but think sometimes we think there's a problem and then all of a sudden we realize we're stuck if we just continue empathizing with the problem. We have to begin to empathize with the possibilities. And there you are, right? You see these little shoes and yeah. then you realize, oh, actually, you know what? Guess what? Our strengths, our activation can be found when we just tell stories of truth. And we, and we allow ourselves to be the good news. Mm. You know, we allow ourselves to be the good news. Like instead of being like, well, I did right or wrong. Well, I brought that. And that was that season of my life. And obviously that was a solution for something. What was it for? Do I still want that solution? Well, I got thrown in jail for that. Perhaps that isn't my solution anymore. I want some different. And it's like, you know, to be honest, I learned now. So letting it all belong, like that unicorn, right. And it's like, oh my goodness, for a month, for a month, like how thankful when I think about the weekly wins and losses platform that we have a community call you know we have people that show up and they share their weekly win and their loss and it's so interesting when when you see the light uh, and the sparkle in their eye and the fuel like you talk about podcasting gives you oxygen and you see the oxygen re-enter the veins and people are brought to the awareness and to the experience of that where they thought they were losing where they blame themselves when they began to realize actually how can i utilize this versus eliminate it and how can i just yeah. seek responsibility and not try to flee because fleeing is just anxious striving away from and that's often what achievement is right like the unhealthy side of achievement i think we're always achieving something but the unhealthy side yeah. is when we're just running from that go ahead yeah that's right I, w- I was wondering if you could expand more that you had a phrase of there that i have not heard that i love i'm going to be mm. thinking about night hopefully not sleeplessly but <laughs> empathizing with the possibilities mm-hmm. is that the idea in your mind that we are reframing you know, ruminations can obviously take us down Mm. very, you know, Mm. dark, dark Mm. kind of rabbit holes. Mm. But that idea when you're saying empathizing more with the possibilities, that sounds like to me, we're now kind of taking it and shifting it the way that we're looking something in our mind. I'm worried about something that I have to do in a month Mm. here, but not focusing on what could come from it. 
Is that what you kind of yeah, think I of? Think, yeah, I think so. I think, you know, and I don't want to have it lost on, um, just imagine you have certain things that you believe are problems and then you chat with someone. How would it feel if they just skipped empathizing with your problem? It wouldn't feel really nice. So to me, it's a little bit like, so step one is, and I have problems too. So uh, things that I perceive as problems anyway. And if I share it with you, right? You're going, oh, okay. I can hear where he's coming from. But if you're a kind person, and to your point, like, I don't know if it fits into your definition, but uh, compassionate kindness, firm and soft at the same time. It looks a bit like I hear what you're saying, and I'm not rushed to take you anywhere other than where you currently are, meaning I must mm-hmm. first be where you are at. You think this is a problem? Of course, I can see why you'd say that. And I feel that for you. The only thing is, if you truly love and care for me, you're going to take a very courageous step and you're going to, you're going to do something that's going to make you feel probably very humble because though you maybe have been my friend for years and you know lots about me, or let's say my wife knows a ton. She's lived with me for 20, 22 years. You know how much courage it takes to speak up and say, you know, here's the thing, baby. And what you're doing here is you're nicely merging the problem, empathizing with the problem with your shifting it and you're revealing that to stay at problem is stuck. So just sitting with it long-term is stuck, but you actually want to embody the next level so that we can move from here to there, but in small token and when person is ready for it. So I don't want to have it lost on empathizing with possibility, meaning all possibility, forget your problem. Actually, people reveal this stuff, their problems, because they believe it is. And we have to really be with them and be like, I can see why. And we ask, why so for you? And really feel and get into their heart, really get into it. Because unless we know what they perceive as being a problem, they'll never trust us to ever take our hand to lead them into what a, by what a, what a possibility might look like. And so I know in the Jewish tradition, it's funny, whenever I say this, I always imagine Jewish people in, in uh, Jersey. I always do. Okay. Because Jewish people have this thing, sit Shiva. Have you heard of that? I just sat uh, last week. Isn't that so, uh, so are you Jewish? I'm Jewish. And I had a dear friend who passed away last week. I referred to him. I, he was the only non-family member who I always called uncle yeah. and passed away suddenly. And I sat with his, um, his, his, his wife, his oh. children who I grew up with who were older than me. And, you know, it's the type of thing. And I want me to cut you off, but yes. So that Please. I'm very familiar, very oh. familiar with it. Well, thank you for cutting me off. Cause I, I get to have somebody who that's beautiful. I, it's funny because here's, here was my unction. Yeah. I felt a nudge and the nudge is James. I think you said this already on a podcast, like one or two ago. And now you're saying it again. The guests are probably getting bored, but I'm like, I got to say it for a reason. And there you light up. And Correct. Beautiful. My friend. Awesome. Awesome. This is what it looks like. I guess when we're connected, right? Yeah. When we're not focused right. on the, what we're focused on the, how we're leading in. Hey, so to that point, can you, can you enlighten the audience? Sit Shiva. Like you're one of the people that does it. You're from the inside. Yes. <laughs> what is this? And I, and I would have to say that I am not observant in any way, but traditionally have a, a great appreciation for my heritage hmm. and love of it. And it's basically a way of paying respect. And so typically because Jewish funerals are so uh, soon after Mm. a a death and depends on, you know, how observant they are, but typically within, you know, a a couple of days afterwards, the family will, as you said, sit Shiva. And that means that either at a family member's house, it could be someone else's house. uh, And for a period going from maybe one day to seven days, depends on what they'd like to do. They sit there and people come and, give them comfort and really just be with them. In fact, in many ways, we talk a lot about being, this is the essence of it, right? Wow. They just are there to be with them. That's all. Wow. And they are there to very, in many ways, humbly receive them and graciously receive them. And, you know, I had not spent time like that with this family in a long time. And I felt so deeply connected and, and understanding, of course, that it was on an occasion that was profoundly sad, but it felt in many ways, um, very inspiring. It was almost very healing. And I, you, you wouldn't think I, I certainly wouldn't expect that it meant as much to them as it did for me, 
but it really was so deeply moving. And I left there feeling good, maybe because in our own ways, we're conditioned to, hey, I did something nice there, but it really was more than that. It was just to be with someone. In many ways, like we said, you know, uh, meet someone where they're at. I love what you said in, 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 in kind of the last segment, this idea of sometimes just listening allows us to hear, you know, I write in the book, the difference between listening and hearing and listening. Mm -hmm. We've all sat in meetings where you see someone who's preparing his next response without really listening. Mm -hmm. And there's the difference between listening and hearing. Sitting Shiv is about listening and hearing. Wow. And listening to those nudges. And uh, I love, oh my goodness. Oh my goodness. That is just, that is truly wonderful. Um, The words come to mind. Sir Francis of Assisi said, if words are necessary, use them. Oh, is that good? And it's like your presence. Yeah. Presence. You know, I'll never, I'll never forget when I was a child. I remember that my parents, my dad said was a pastor. And so he did, he officiated at a lot of weddings and of course, younger couples. And so presentation, here's the link and here is where you can make your donation. And so gifts were welcome. <laughs> right. But then when anniversaries happened, well, what, what did it say at the base of the card? Your presence is our gift. That's right. And I remember going, that's bizarre. It also seems like, yeah, they may need another coffee maker. They may have three, but having a fourth might not be a bad idea. I don't know. But ultimately they're going, you know, actually your presence is all we got. Presence. That's all we got. Wow. Wow. That is just tender, my friend. That's just awesome. Um, Yeah. And the gifts that we, the, the, the gifts that we receive when we just volunteer, uh, like you said, you've never done it before. Uh, I know for me, I feel almost most comfortable when I'm standing in unknown territory. I like that. Mm. I like it. And I, you know, you I too. see, right. Yeah. Yeah. Is that how yeah. you operate? Yeah. I think that intellectually, I know that I do most of my significant growth when I am uncomfortable. Mm-hmm. Uh, but that's more in hindsight. And now I've gotten more comfortable feeling that way while I'm in it, but you find it almost is it freeing for you? You know what? It was a deep challenge. I read, and I think it was in the scripture uh, or was it in another a spiritual writing? I forget either Bible or another book, but um, there was just, there's this uh, script and it said something like uh, you build, you, you, you know, you build the greatest of things or you build the greatest of all when you build on that, which you have no reference for. And I remember thinking, Hmm, you know what? I've been building but am I building in that which I have no reference for? And to some degree, many of my businesses, I started from scratch. And so I would do, so I've done a lot of pre-sales on things, whether whether it's uh, custom homes and different uh, projects that I've done. Um, So I'm going, yeah, it's true. But I know something that Tony Robbins said years ago, um, to the exact degree that you can comfortably handle your uncertainties is to the exact degree that you're going to enjoy life. And he says, the key word is comfortably handle. Right. or comfortably enjoy them. And I thought, hmm, I'm managing my uncertainties right now. <laughs> right. And I'm handling them. But here's the thing. I would like for me to be, and there's a, a Japanese, he's one of the, I think he is the, the wealthiest Japanese investors um, in on you know that side of the world. And he says, you know that you're doing about well when it comes to financials and you have good thinking and good thoughts and good heart about it. When you're about as happy with the incoming as you go with the, or as you are with the outgoing. And and I just thought, you know what, there's a whole, so when I tied this together, it just, it just became, and I'll be honest, even my morning ritual, like I really enjoy getting on a vibrating plate and really all that it does is it decenters you. Mm. draws you into discomfort and so your strength comes like the human i've said this before on the podcast but as a human you get your strength always when you're out of balance so when you're walking it's one step at a time it's not like a kangaroo too it's you're actually always out of balance and so when you take a step when you stumble along the beauty of it so so what's it for you like i want to i don't think i've met I, another soul that can you know i relate i, that I think you, i think your audience should take heed of that advice because that's brilliant this idea of so much of us start our day. I want to get centered. I want to get in balance and it's counterintuitive. Mm. And here, because I think when you're doing what your approach is, you are able to then come back into balance. I think Mm. that if you focus just on that sense of being balanced, Mm. I think 
really you only have one other way to go. Mm -hmm. And that may be a little out of balance. And in, in mm -hmm. fact, we're never really in balance. I, there was this idea, and <laughs> I'm sure you've spoken about it uh, on wins and losses, this idea of work-life balance. Mm -hmm. And I've been in uh, enough conversations now with you know business leaders. They say, you know, there's no such thing. Um, True. We're never in perfect alignment or balance never. when it comes to this. But it's, I think that's, that's being comfortable, mm -hmm. exactly as you're saying. Mm -hmm. And knowing that we can, we can seesaw a little bit. And there are going to be times when we're heavier on one side than the other. And I think that's, that's so important. Mm -hmm. That's well said, well said. And, and, you know, it's, it's obvious when it comes to joy and the peace you talked about earlier, that you understand that um, what we really are looking for is not for more luxuries and more comforts. And this is, I think, part of that chafing against, you know, perhaps how things were rigged or set up for you. You're like, actually, what we want is we want to not do the easy thing. We want to do the hard thing, but the worthy thing, the thing that gives us all the zap and the juice, the hard as in like the meaningful, the integrous right. thing. Yeah, that's right. Can you talk to us a bit about, you said five principles, five key principles of and tapping into peace and joy. Well, what are those five? And I know you started earlier and uh, if you wouldn't mind, just slow it down for audience a little bit. Yeah, so I, I'll lay them out as what I consider an unself-help approach. One, because it doesn't feel like a process like so many of these. When I wrote this book, I was trying to find those self-help books that I wrote and nothing came to me very instinctual. It was too processy. They weren't natural mm -hmm. or organic. Mm -hmm. So starting with this thesis that I wanted to feel light, I found that in order to feel light, I first needed to be solid. Mm. And so for me, I built off that idea of kindness. And so the five principles are kindness, gratitude, integrity, humility, and acceptance. And to tie in that unself approach, unself help approach, it's because the thread between all of those are about selflessness. Mm. And I think that so much of what we do with these five and whether it prompts folks to think about their own five or additional ones or one or two or whatever it is, it's this idea of what kind of remove, removes that weight of burden and anxiety and worry that for me just sort of plagued me for so long and got me stuck in my own head. I think there was one thing that I wanted to do was get unstuck. Mm. Those ruminations, those worries, and just... Mm focusing so much inward mm -hmm. rather than saying, listen, I can be, you know, more selfless and in many ways emphasize being rather than doing. And that's the essence exactly what you're talking about when we're sitting with someone giving comfort. Exactly. Sitting Shiva, if you think about it. So they often talk about this, this Eastern, um, you know, spiritual figure, Jesus, you know, he talks, he often, his example of life is a powerless power. So <laughs> Instead of the doing, we think power comes from the doing, but it comes, I mean, not in spite of, uh, some of it is because of as well, but in essence, you know, it, it actually, the power comes when you give of yourself the exact opposite of what the world thinks. I love, so to your, just make sure I get this right, kindness, gratitude, integrity, humility, and self-acceptance. And acceptance. Mm -hmm. Acceptance is easy when we look at it in terms of accepting the things that necessarily we don't want in our lives. And I believe that it has to do with rooting us in reality and living in many ways. It's acceptance is acknowledging the truth so that we're not regretting the things, uh, the way things, you know, we wish they were, mm. but rather accepting and acknowledging and recognizing how they really are. Mm -hmm. And I believe that what allow that allows us to do is that flexibility again. Hey, I can feel different ways and it's mm -hmm. okay. But more than that, I think that we could then identify something that maybe we didn't want to happen and find the positive in, in it in order to make peace. And that's ultimately what allows us to hold these conflicting views. It allows us to eliminate ego. It, it prompts us to feel it first, to actually acknowledge our feelings about it. Now, this idea of going deep and being vulnerable mm -hmm. is very much in vogue these days, but mm -hmm. there, there's True. there's... There's purpose behind it, though, mm -hmm. and allows us to get more deeper in touch and at least to say, OK, I actually do feel this way. I'm not denying my denying my true feelings. Love it. Love it. Love it. And yeah. And to your point earlier, when we, you know, brought in the talk 
go beneath the surface. Let's go. Let's get connected real quick. Let's get real yeah. quick. Right. Um, yeah, it's interesting. So I'm just going to unfold here for half a second, if you don't mind. One of the things, and I'll be totally honest, Joshua, when I first met you, I remember thinking to myself, okay, this gentleman, I, I really like him. And so I, I keep saying Joshua and your name is Josh. I'm so sorry. Anything. I'll, I'll respond to anything. <laughs> respond to anything. That's so nice. But here's the thing. I met you and I'm like, okay, I really like you, but I'm skeptical. I'm like, why am I skeptical? Yeah. And what was interesting, and you just said something about rooted in reality. You see, there's one thing that I really focus on when it comes to seeing clearly. You got to see things for what they are. If you're going to be able to fantasy, it's not happening. Now, some people, they talk about unicorns. And the unicorn they're talking about is a like pie in the sky. It's like we're floating away. But you're this grounded human who chooses to stay here and to bring the good news here. We're not floating off anywhere. And so you're so rooted. So what you're saying right there, it's interesting because it didn't take more than like a sentence into our little intro. I'm like, there is this guy is of the earth. <laughs> He's of the earth. I mean it, my brother. I mean it. I'm like, who is this guy? Who is it? Because he has got such a glow. And sometimes people who are about glowing, perhaps they, they smoke too much. Perhaps they, they, you know, they went to this, this shop and, and they bought, and there's nothing wrong with gems or it's not right or wrong. But, you know, they're so into it that where are they? They're like in some universe and you're going, hey, can you talk to me here? Like, I need you to be here with me in this. And they're mm-hmm. like, la, la, da, la, la, out there. And when I met you, it's like, you are just vibing with me instantly. And so there's something about that space that I just wanted to honor in you. Um, I appreciate and- that kind of that compliment. That's kind of you. And I appreciate the skepticism as well, because I think it's fair, it's healthy. And as I often say, you take everything at face value. Yeah. But the truth is, is that I wrote this book for myself selfishly. Love it. Love it. I, I was, I was, I needed something and I felt that I needed something that was almost back to basics. Mm -hmm. I needed a simplified and it wasn't a process. It was a perspective. It was this Mm -hmm. idea of how do I, how do I find that wholeness in me? Mm -hmm. It's this idea of what defines me? What's my, you know, we talk in sports about the fundamentals, you know, Mm -hmm. how do I get back to those basics and work on that foundation for being rather than doing. And I felt it really had to do with principles about selflessness Mm -hmm. because Mm -hmm. that allowed me to then, you said, understand very clearly, it has nothing to do with what we accumulate or acquire Mm -hmm. has to do with how we treat others. And, Mm -hmm. and I am so convinced that this path in conjunction with any other that's helpful, but can help guide someone towards Mm -hmm. relieving some of that anxiety that I know from I've, I've, I've experienced it. I've dealt with it. And I know that so much of it is because I couldn't get out of here. Mm -hmm. Why? What are you doing all this for? I know the listeners are picking up. You keep coming back. You keep coming back. You keep coming back. What are you doing all this for? What value? Is it a value? What are you doing all of this for? You know, I, I've been so fortunate in my life and call it privilege, call it just um, good fortune. Um, And I think that I never really found I'm 47 years old. I've never found or understood this idea of what I should be doing that would actually give me my own joy. And can I pause is, you for a second? Yeah, go ahead. It seems like you found something that gives you joy, my <laughs> friend, because you got so much joy and peace on you. And whoever isn't looking and watching this dude here, this dude, this brother from Jersey, my friend, sitting Shiva, you just look at the guy, forget about all the Shiva talk. You just look at the dude. He's not saying he's floating. <laughs> he's well, not. then we're going on tour together because you are just going to cue me up. And that's the, that's the, no, the, but you're the greatest yeah, there's evidence here. You go, sorry. Yeah. yeah. I appreciate that. And you know, what's interesting. Mm-hmm. I, it's the first person who said that to me. I'm not surprised it came from you because that's mm-hmm. a real gift. Mm-hmm. And that's a very generous, very kind compliment because I think that I didn't want to write a book about happiness. This isn't a book about finding your purpose. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. But instead, those uh, much more, almost uh, less abstract things, peace and joy, and mm-hmm. finding that kind of fulfillment that comes from within. So to answer your question, what do I want to get out of this? I'm already gotten. 
And I just want to do more about it. I want to have conversations like this. I want to share it. And when I wrote the book initially, I said, look, if this helps one person, I have mission accomplished. It helped mm -hmm. one, it helped me. Mm -hmm. And now I get notes from people and I say, wow. thank you. This is what wow. I needed. This sort of distilled it down into a way that I can uh, mm. identify things that are practical. Mm -hmm. You know, they're actionable. Mm -hmm. It means something. This is actually the type of thing that's realistic. You know, it's mm -hmm. not perfect. It's not the end all. It's not a prescription, mm -hmm. but it's this idea of finding mm -hmm. what defines you. What are you wow. about and what yeah. matters most in your life? Yeah. It's almost like um, you showed up and you said, I, I, I don't want to walk around with a bunch of contraptions. I'm going to uncontraptionalize my life. I'm going to say, what actually is this all about? And listeners, who doesn't want to live a simple life? Yeah. Right. You want to get back to the basics. What's most important? I'll never forget years ago, we took a, a road trip uh, in high school. We went through Pennsylvania and we stopped at some of the Amish and they took us in and we stayed the night and they had a meal and the candles and, you know, this simplicity. And I remember sitting at the table and thinking, this is what it kind of felt like living in my parents' home, though my parents weren't Amish people, uh, but they were Mennonite. So there's some connection there. Um, but there is just this simplicity and uh, just sharing a meal breaking bread together and just wrapping up the day. And, and uh, of course the light bulb wasn't on. So there's no sleep disturbance. You're going to bed after this because what else is there to do? Perhaps you're getting tired because the camel does what it does, but it's just that. And I struggle to say the word pure because I think in some way, the purity culture has done us a disservice. Like we're thinking that we got to make everything pure, everything pure, everything pure. And in so doing, we found a way to disconnect with just a sizable group of people, which is really unfortunate, but Enough of me. I want to hear more, more about you. How, how would you say, go ahead. You were going to say something. No, you, you prompted a, a quick story. I'll tell because Please. we said we were going to keep it off the surface and get underneath it. <laughs> yeah. And I'll share with you. Um, I started this book in March of 2020 when I knew I needed something. Mm -hmm. I actually put it down. I didn't feel confident enough to put it out there mm -hmm. and I didn't quite have it. Mm -hmm. Year later, I picked it up. This is beginning of 21. I started to get a little bit further into it. I knew I had kindness as kind of that first principle and was trying to dig into it. And about May of last year, so about a year ago, mm -hmm. I had a significant bout of depression and sadness that I had not seen in years. Wow. The way I could describe it was, it was as if in the distance, I saw these dark clouds coming mm. and I knew they were coming my way. And I also knew I was powerless to stop them or at least mm. to try to attempt to stop them. And they kept coming. And of course I got in my head. And when they came for about two, three days, I had experienced that darkness that I hadn't had in many years that really mm. in many ways prompted, uh, or was the Genesis for the history behind this book. And mm. after they finally passed, I was depleted. I didn't share with anyone. I tried to cover it up. I was a little more equipped than previously about how to handling it emotionally, but still, I was overcome and I ended up going to Montana and I went by myself and being out there in nature, almost like you're talking about when you were in the Amish country and feeling this mm -hmm. sense of, I like to say in my book and humility, cultivating awe. And I think that's so important, this idea of the growth of wonder. Mm -hmm. And I felt something finally come over me. I went into the town. I was in Bozeman, Montana, and I ended up going all around Montana, but I went into this little shop and I found this card. And on the cover, it said, find the joy in every day. Mm. I went back to where I was staying, this lodge. I wrote down the five principles. I mailed it to myself. Wow. And when I got home, I had this card waiting for me. And I wrote the manuscript off of that. I wow. keep the card on my desk here and I refer back to it. And I wrote down each principle and what I felt guided it. Again, kindness by compassion, gratitude by awareness, integrity by decency, humility by, by perspective, and acceptance by flexibility. And I keep that card as a reminder in the multicolored, find the joy in every day is what inspired the cover, which is not of a unicorn on my book, but of the essence of it, that color and vibrancy and hope and, and virtue. And that's something that led me. And I have felt full and whole and light and solid ever since. Mm. Isn't it interesting? Gosh, right. When we allow all of life to serve us, we think something is sent to take us down, but I just go back. Like as a writing in the Bible it talks about before there was light, there was darkness. And oftentimes what do people think? Well, 
light is good, darkness is bad, because after light came good things like humans and animals and whatever else the story is talking about. But I think we forget about that everything was built on darkness. Right. So it's like, just to bring in that little play, you know, to think about when I, when I listen to what you're saying, it seems to me like you found the awe and the wonder, not in spite of darkness, but because of darkness. As if it, oh my goodness. Like, yeah. how can you not just celebrate and be like, wow, this is all for me. Unreal. Mm -hmm. Didn't run from it. Good job. What a distinction too, because I think in my mind up until this moment, I probably felt it was in spite of, and not mm -hmm. because of, mm -hmm. but you're right. Everything comes from it. And I think that's, um, that's powerful. Something I'm probably going to consider much more deeply and almost be grateful for that as well. We have to be, we can't pick and choose what we're grateful for. We have to be grateful for it all. Well, I often just for myself, what I, what I ask myself is if I don't say, if, if I don't say whatever I'm experiencing is because of, or I got through because of, but if I use the word in spite of, I'm setting myself from not wanting to experience that next time. And to be honest, why don't I tell the truth? <laughs> And when I tell the truth, yeah, the next time it comes, I'm priming myself to lean in versus like to defend and, you know, get all positiony about the thing. Right. So, yeah, yeah. I love that. And in many ways, that's like the perfect connection point to what I say in gratitude. And I, mm -hmm. I like your phrasing even better. I used an expression that things happen for me, not to me. Mm -hmm. And I really do believe that as well. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. How has this simplified approach to so this five step that you talk about? kindness, gratitude, integrity, humility, acceptance. How has this five-step approach helped your personal life? And you shared a few things, but if you just think about, perhaps share something that you haven't shared before and lean into a space and, and how has it helped your personal life? I think that very broadly, this foundation has become my default, almost a when in doubt. Mm. And I think wow. that is where the shift that has been most noticeable in me, you know, for those that are listening, that find I've talked about angst and worry, but how about annoyance and nuisance mm -hmm. and agitation, a lot of other emotions that serve no, you know, constructive purpose and utility, but we all mm -hmm. feel on a regular basis, mm -hmm. but I have just found day to day. It just has allowed me to with kindness, not just doing kind acts, but being kind, right. Being versus doing feeling a sense of empathy and compassion towards someone, the gratitude for anyone who's, you know, saying, oh, I've heard about gratitude. That's the easiest one to get started with, right? Mm -hmm. There's no right way to do it. The only wrong way would be not to do anything, even if it's just an acknowledgement at mm -hmm. the, at any point in your day, mm -hmm. the integrity we talked a lot about the humility is the one that has probably had the most impact that in acceptance because humility, I think that we all have this sense of ego and humility C.S. Lewis, there's a great quote. You gave me mm -hmm. one, a beautiful quote from before about using words mm -hmm. if necessary. Mm -hmm. C.S. Lewis, a quote that I, I used to start off the chapter in humility is, um, it's not thinking less of yourself. It's thinking of yourself less. Mm. And Good I point. found that that is something when we talk about unself helping ourselves, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. think less of myself. I mm -hmm. think it does have nothing to do with, you know, lack of confidence or anything like that. Spot on. And certainly acceptance, when you ask how it's helped me in my daily life, I think acceptance has been in many ways coming to terms with. Mm. Um, the perfect example is mm. out of this term of, mm. of COVID where you'd hear people, I'm sure, say, I'm over it. Mm -hmm. you know, we certainly didn't have the ability to be over it, you know, mm. but at the same time, we can accept that it's part of our reality mm -hmm. and we can't control it, but we can control how we feel about it. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. That's powerful. That's, I love that. I, yeah. Yeah. You know what? Acceptance. It seems like when I got a little acronym that I use and that's, um, I just, so it's RAJ, R-A-J. Uh, if you're in non-resistance and if you're in acceptance and if you're in non-judgment, um, it ends up just kind of being, you know, and, uh, yeah, it's, uh, it's so fascinating. I, sometimes I wonder why is it that hmm, we seem we it seems that society feels like they can connect best with others when they view this life as an unsafe place mm. 
you know, and I, I just think, oh, that's just so, that's just so, um, so unfortunate. But again, I got to, I got to be careful because we have to find a way of integrating and people yeah. are connecting. So the beauty is let, let them connect as they wish to connect. I get to decide what it is for me and my default. I love right. what you did. That intentional work, you came up with your five. And I think to your point, this book is so less about you hearing you. So this book isn't that everybody needs to do exactly what you do, but to encourage them, you set a model forward and some parameters going, listen, this is what it looks like when somebody gets about this work. I did it for me. Would you like to do it for you now? Now that these are principles, I'll be honest. I think they're great principles. If you want to use these amazing, but the point is who are you on the inside? What fuels you? Because when something goes rough, you're going to need a default. That's right. Right. That's exactly right. And you used the word before that. I think, boy, doesn't get probably uh, enough credit when you were talking about acceptance and judgment resistance. Mm -hmm. And I'm sure in all of your work with the people that you help and the people that you reach, that idea of resistance is almost, it's underneath everything, right? I got to think that it drives so much of the challenges that people Mm -hmm. face. Mm -hmm. I mean, that's Mm -hmm. sitting right there. Mm -hmm. You know, and likewise in your work, it's like, so you live in Jersey and I can see buildings in the back and I'm sure there's the odd tree and there's flowers and different things. Nature is everywhere, right? Sun is shining into your face. If you're going to resist the sunshine, yeah, you can buy blinds, you can get blackout curtains, but no matter how you try, you're going to have to get tape. You're going to have to make this pristinely locked out. It's going to be so hard to resist the invitation to harmonize with nature. It just doesn't bode well for the human. (laughs) It doesn't yeah. work very well. It just keeps coming. Like nature says, I don't care what you think. I love you so much. I'm going to nicely invite you into just letting whatever happen, let it happen. And how can you participate with it now? Because that's really all we got. I'll, I'll tell you an yes, interesting so. story, right? I was driving to school. I was bringing my kids to school the other day. And Harrison, he's got high functioning autism. He wasn't having a good morning. And I looked into the mirror and I said, Harrison, tell me what's your day going to be about? And he says to me, uh, and he used to be, he used to just come on done and be like, oh, it's all garbage. It's all, it's all crap and whatever. He looks at me and I started bawling inside and a little bit on the outside. He says to me, dad, you know what I realized I got to do today? I said, what's that Harrison? He goes, I just got to participate with what's right in front of me. And I'm like, wow. holy, come on. <laughs> that's all that life asks of us. Don't right. label it, just participate. Like how simple is that? Just participate with it. Beautiful. Right? Wow. I can't even imagine your reaction to hearing that. It must have been pride, emotion, uh, awe. Yeah. I mean, that's that's deeply profound and, and wise. Well, I was thinking as I was driving, we never know when our time on earth is going to be over. We don't know. And this doesn't need to be dystopic or anything like it. But I think as a parent, um, and it doesn't need to be that you're a parent. It can be you lead people or whatever it ends up being. You leave your mark. You just want to make sure that you are beneficial in in the best way you could. And so I think in that moment, and sometimes I have been concerned, is Harrison going to be okay? He's high functioning, but he's, you know, he's autistic, but high functioning. But But I have that concern. And when he said that, my friend, I realized that kid was going to be okay. Yeah. Because that's the magic sauce of life right there. That's right. Yeah. I thank you for sharing that. That's, um, yeah, you can be more than okay, mm-hmm. especially mm-hmm. with that uh, beautiful perspective. That's, mm-hmm. that's, that's powerful. Yeah. Mm-hmm. What do you enjoy? If I think, so now let's shift it over. So you got this amazing book, The Unicorn and You. I love that so much. I'm thinking of this little girl running with her shoes and you're (laughs) thinking about the vibrancy and colors and you're saying, hey, people, hey, people, are you looking at the color of each one of us? It's beautiful. We don't need to convert anyone to my color. This is your color. Can you own it? Can you be, what do you enjoy most about speaking about these perspectives with other people? I love hearing, I love a conversation like this where you can speak about it in just conversation and share that very idea that, hey, what's yours? You know, this is all about of uh, the unicorn in you, right? Who are you? You know, who is, again, that special you? So what I love speaking about it is when it prompts people to think about, you know, and maybe they'll share it right there, but to share these little nuggets of wisdom that many of which you've shared today, but just sort of this recognition that there is a way to create a 
foundation for being in many ways, just a sense of knowing who we are. That's really what it's about. Who are you deep down when it matters? And then let your behavior be an extension of that, that way of being. That's all. Being rather than doing, getting out of our own head. But I love talking about it because in many ways, it reinforces that feeling that I had, that there was something important to share here. I think for so long, and probably the reason why I came back to it a second time, there's certainly a power, uh, a, a pattern here as I've shared, you know, second times around, but that idea of, of coming back to it, knowing that, okay, I feel confident enough to share this perspective because I feel like there's resonance with, with mm-hmm. people who want some way to just kind of be, mm-hmm. and how do you be, and how do you, you know, understand that to be light, we first have to be solid. Mm-hmm. That's really at the heart of, of, of what I'm, what I love speaking about. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Well, that's just, yeah, that's, uh, yeah, that's grounded, my friend. I love it. Um, when you think about the reception from others of these things, what surprised you there? I think what surprised me was I didn't know who was going to get it. And I didn't know if it was going to, mm-hmm. when I worked with the publisher with this and with the whole discussion of how to position and so forth, and in my heart of hearts, and also just, you know, I really felt strongly, this is universal, it's for everyone. And, you know, again, that path will reveal itself, the the audience will as well. Mm -hmm. What surprised me most was that some of the notes that I received, and I'll share two quick ones. One was my 20 year old niece. Well, my niece is 20 years old, and she sent me a beautiful um, note, and an emotional one, where she had underlined and highlighted, and she showed me the part where I talked about my struggles. And I think in many ways, Mm. I always joke that Mm. as a kid, you never have any sense of how old our aunts and uncles are or parents for that matter. You know, I I, I could be 20 for all intents and purposes. I could be 60, Mm -hmm. you know, there's no context. And to see that from her perspective, that her uncle, who I have a very, very special bond and relationship with, wow, he felt something that I felt. Mm -hmm. And that moved me more than I think I would have ever expected. On the flip side, I had a 75 year old cousin who sent me a note saying, I felt better than I have in a really long time because I'm reading your book every day and it's made an impact on me. And it's wow, wow. maybe introduced a different, a different approach. Um, and that to me was, it's all gravy at this point. It's all mm-hmm. gravy. This conversation is like, mm-hmm. I mean, th- this is what it's all about for me. It's um, holding your pain for the strength that it is. Yeah. And those tears are strong. Whatever that is, it's strong. Yeah. It's like this gives a gift. This is a gift. This pain that I'm sharing gift. is right. a gift. And yeah. instead of you just being like, here are all my accolades, all my goodness, what you did is you connected. I often have this thing when I go to talks and I was at this... Uh, I shared this with the audience thing before, but I was at a talk and they invited a bunch of people, you know, to the stage every now and again, and they, they introduce. And of course, what do they do? They bring out all the accolades prior to. So you've heard this, but I, it, it was weird at this event. When the speaker came out, I began to realize that the attendees were all beginning to look at their phones and everyone's head was like, Boom, and it just started to happen. I'm like, what is this? And all of a sudden I recognize a pattern. Like typically when, when I get invited on stage, whatever, like the idea is sure. People might say accolades, but I'm like, could you just like, that's fine, whatever. But I come on and I say, okay, here's kind of where, who, who I really am. I'm going to give you a real version. Here are the things I'm struggling with today. Here's how I'm really human. Like I just make this easy for myself. Cause I'm not going to try to prove that I got it all figured out. This is, this is crap. Right. But these speakers, when they came on, instead of just being real, they would for the next five minutes or so just go on this rant of and it build around their accolades and support them even more. And so I think we make it hard for people to trust us when right. we don't let them see our full humanity. If we're just one side of the coin, it's not possible. So now apparently we're making the audience do the work of seeing where we struggle. But if they realize that we're anxious about where we struggle, they'd be like, I don't know about this human because right. Much, right. So I don't know, like make it easy. So to, to yeah, go ahead. It's completely more disarming, right? Mm-hmm, mm-hmm, mm-hmm. To go the yeah. other way rather than build yeah. off all of the, yeah, I'm, I'm, I'm wonderful. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Mr. Wonderful, right? right. <laughs> yeah. Josh, 
Um, it's been a pleasure. Now, this is a question that my audience really appreciates. Um, and it puts you in the hot seat. You've been in the hot seat all the time. I'm in the hot <laughs> ring behind me, but you're in the hot seat. <laughs> okay. So the question here is uh, surrounding where do you struggle, Josh? Where do you struggle in relation to, if you think about some of the writing, some of the stuff you've put out, and clearly let me say this, I can only imagine just before you hit publish that you struggle with a thought of, is this good enough? Or because once you hit print, it's done. It's in the bookstores. It's there in the libraries. It's there. And I don't know if that's your thing, but where would you say you struggle and it actually has you actively pursuing and engaging and it keeps you right in that tension space of um, feeling out of balance almost. And it kind of keeps drawing you. What is that for you? Something that has been, and it's perfectly timely, your question, because I was wrestling with it this morning. What has been a struggle recently is I'm an organized person. I like to feel that I have accomplished what I need to and do so in a way that meets sort of a construct in my head. And lately I have been not disorganized, but not accomplishing everything I want at the end of each day and letting that be okay and enough. That idea of acceptance is so hard when it's saying, yes, but I still needed to get this done. So accepting that I didn't is one thing, but the fact that I still is still out there, that's another. And so what I struggle with is in many ways being okay with it. And I found that I have let so much go that I normally wouldn't. Mm. And it's created a different type of stress to me. Usually it was the stress of finishing things and I would make sure that I did. And now I'm not finishing a lot of things because I have so much on my plate. And so the stress of saying, but that's okay, mm. you'll get there. And I found that in due time I have and in many ways, I've been sleeping a lot better because of it. So full circle to our uh, initial conversation about sleep. <laughs> yeah, like you said, how integrity makes for the softest pillow. Mm -hmm. Maybe when you go to sleep, and I'm not playing this out. I'm just saying when you go to sleep, and by the way, I'm here with you, my friend. This is not any solution for anything because I think that's also a very self-helpish approach. I'm not about this. I feel you. So I'm going to do Shiva with you the best I can. But you said earlier into your playbook, having integrity makes for the softest pillow. When you hit the pillow, you know, and I, and I, and I know where you're coming from. We have things in it. We like to focus on integrity is all that matters. But sometimes it's like, oh, there's four or five other things, you know, but maybe you just check in. I don't know. This is just a, a short little, and this is probably not because Shiva is like, perhaps I'll, if, it, if it was Shiva, I'm going to stress test you. If it was Shiva, then you would say what you wanted. And then I give it to you. Is that kind of how it works? Right. If so. you want, right. Yeah. Kind of like that. Okay. So do you want a perspective? If you don't, please say, just no, I'm, I'm good. Right. Okay. Would you like a perspective? Yeah, absolutely. Okay. Um, yeah. So the integrity makes for the softest pillow, perhaps when your head hits the pillow, it's, uh, it's just that you lean in and you're like, actually, I made a decision that integrity is at the core of my life. And that's all that I was about the whole time. And why let three checkboxes ruin the gift of me deciding that what I decided on, which was integrity and a handshake, why, why doubt that that's good enough? Mm. I don't know. So perhaps shift it, empathize to the, and I hear you, my friend, I hear you. I hear it. You think it's something. And by the way, I don't hear that you say it's a problem, but I hear you maybe there's something for you there. I have no idea. These are your words. So I'm just putting your words yeah. to the yeah, other work there. Yeah. Well, I'm certainly am grateful for that. I'm grateful for you. Uh, and I'm grateful for all that you do and the work that you do. I know that um, the people you help are as well. Well, you are a lovely presence today. And, and uh, yeah, these are a lot of nice words we say here, but I think we mean it. So this is a good That's thing. Right. Yeah, this is a good thing. So my friend from Jersey, where can people find you and your work? I want people to know where to go. Make it easy for them. Tell them exactly yeah, where to go because I want people to find that book, go and grab it. And I'd love to, even more than checking out the book, interact with me. I want to connect and hear your thoughts. So mm -hmm. I'm at joshkramer.com. Very easy to connect with me there. And if you want to look at the book, feel free to. It's the unicornandyou.com. And on Instagram, it's at the unicornandyou. 
And, and Kramer uh, is with K, by the way, with, right? With a K, that's right. J-O-S-H-K-R-A-M-E-R. Mm -hmm. And uh, I can say wholeheartedly that uh, I was uh, amongst uh, a good company today, a true unicorn, uh, <laughs> James Hepner, for sure. Oh, that's lovely. That's I've never thought of myself as a unicorn, but perhaps today I let myself into your space and I'm with you, <laughs> with you. That's good. That's awesome. Thank you, my friend. Thanks for the sunshine. Thanks for the smiles. Thanks for the honesty. Thanks for the rawness. Folks, you know where to go. Go check out Josh's work. Uh, honestly, he's a, you know, he's somebody that you're going to want to tap into. And what I love probably most of what you've done from this whole conversation, you said, listen, just connect with me. You feel that's this right. heart, just this podcast, whatever this meant to you. Choose to send him a note. Don't send me a note. Send him a note. Tell him. He like send me a note. Go ahead. But send Josh a note. Let him know what it means to you. My friends, thank you for showing up. Thank you, Josh. I appreciate you, man. Thank you. Thank you. I sincerely hope you enjoyed that little interplay. If you like the podcast episode, let us know by subscribing, leaving a little review, and sharing with a friend as you feel appropriate. Honestly, the guests that I host on this show, they love the feedback. And I personally love knowing that you're listening. So whether you choose to work with me as a guide or not, and that's your guide or not, that's simply great. Why, you ask? Well, because you're obviously one of those that's listened to the very end of this podcast. You've clearly made a decision to invest in yourself. And honestly, how isn't that just the best news? So if you decide you need and or want to get unstuck by activating your creativity and your resources, if you want to see things clearly, if you want to get to your next level, if you want to live with vibrant energy and passion, Simply go to www.jameshepner.com for one-on-one -on -one coaching and or go to www.weeklywinsandlosses.com for the no-charge Friday noon global community weekly wins and losses video call. So again, I thank you for investing in yourself. See you next time. My sincere hope is that you've gleaned a few nuggets for yourself and a few pieces of interest that help you move forward in your unique journey. So again... I thank you for joining me here. This is James Hefner clocking out. Until next time, peace out, rock up.